Good afternoon, everybody. I'm the Reverend Dr. Jonathan Chapman. I'm the pastor of Westfield Church in Killingly, Connecticut. Uh, and we have a particular story at Westfield beyond just virtual worship, uh, but pertinent to this conversation. Uh, one thing we've noticed is that some of the conversations around uh, virtual worship and gathering digitally while distanced um, have largely been led by congregations that have multiple full-time staff people uh, or uh, substantial financial resources that they have available to invest in these sorts of things. Um, and it seemed prudent and helpful to offer some insight from a church that has uh, one full-time staff person. We have one person who's at 30 hours a week and then a number of people who are very minimally paid for minimal hours, not that we're trying to screw anybody, but just not, uh, you know, we don't have a huge staff working on this at once. Um, and very limited resources to financially to make the technology and the, the um, smoothness of everything happen. Um, and so we wanted to offer some insight. We've been hanging in there pretty tight and pretty well um, and have turned some actual corners during this time apart. And so we thought it'd be cool to share some of that with you. So I'll let Kevin introduce himself. Sure. Uh, I'm Kevin Williams. Uh, my title officially at Westfield is Director of Welcome. And ironically, as we headed into this pandemic, I was in the middle of a Lenten book study on Invited <laughs> uh, by Leslie Verner, which um, as we talked a lot about how we welcome people and greet people, uh, we all of a sudden became scattered and disparate. So um, we've done a lot of work on that front to try to make sure that our community building stays solid. Um, I also was, I guess, the unfortunate one among us to know just enough to be dangerous about technology. Uh, and so I was the guy that I, I've used this analogy before. If you remember the scene from Apollo 13, where they dumped a box of parts on the table and said, bring them back safely from the moon. Uh, I was kind of the guy that got a box of parts dumped on the table and they said, bring our worship back safely to our folks on a Sunday. So, um, so that's where it all started. And uh, John and I have been partners in crime through this journey and done a lot to try to um, figure out not necessarily how to preserve what we did before in a different way, but how do we move forward in a new way that builds on what we had and takes us into uh, a new and even um, even bigger direction in terms of impact. So there you go. Uh, one thing we've noticed from these um, webinars is that there's a lot of specific questions that people have that we don't always have time to get to. Uh, so we're going to invite you, if you have specific questions as we're going along, to put them in the chat box or post them on Facebook if you're around, if we're there. Uh, and Tiffany or one of us will snag it and try our best to answer, to give you specific insight into whatever challenge you are facing. Not that we are experts, but we've been pretty effective so far. So um, just want to share what we got with everybody because it's not a zero sum game. We are in it together and trying to do the right thing by the gospel together. And so uh, we're here to help. Thank you both of you for being here. Um, Jonathan, the, our Facebook folks didn't see the beginning because we had um, a glitch, which you're probably familiar with. <laughs> but uh, maybe you could just, you know, start talking about what, who your church is. Um, sure. The folks on Facebook will catch up with. With who you so are. I'm the pastor at Westfield Church in Killingly, Connecticut. Uh, Westfield, like many of our churches, was the town's first congregation. So we have a 300 plus year history. Um, and when I came to Westfield in 2012, they were just coming out of a really difficult season. Uh, they had gotten down to at times worshiping 20 in the ladies parlor because everybody fit and it was cheaper to keep. They made some really difficult decisions. They actually brought me on at three quarter time. Uh, and we decided, had an agreement to get me to full-time in five years. We were able to make it in four. Average Sunday attendance for us is about 160 to 180 um, in person. And so we've been beyond that in virtual worship. Uh, and, and largely Westfield, uh, I find Westfield to be a remarkable place. Uh, one, for their flexibility. Two, I do not encounter the typical sort of Yankee stubbornness, which I say with all the love of my heart, of don't tell me what to do, we can't change that uh, I'll make up my own mind. They are willing and flexible. And I think that's largely because they had gotten to a place where they didn't have anything left to lose but everything. Uh, and that's when they really turned a corner. So that's to say that when we had to make the switch from one Sunday to the next, uh, from in-person worship to virtual worship, they were game. They were ready for it. It's definitely not all of our people's favorite thing in the world, uh, but they were willing and able to jump on board. Part of that is because we've been very intentional in creating and cultivating online community 
um, over the last seven years. Uh, for us, that looks like a Facebook page, which is all outward, that's marketing only. We don't do community building on our Facebook page within the con congregation. But we also have a group uh, that is our Facebook group of our circle of care is what we refer to it. So those are members, friends, and family of Westfield Church that are in this Facebook group. Uh, right now, I think it's about 470 members. And we, uh, our staff and I, engage people daily in that group. Now, it could be anything from um, just making conversation and killing some time together, which I'll often do, to ridiculous memes, how do you take your coffee, predictive texts, what's your gravestone going to be, uh, to prayer requests and real concerns and conversation starters, what do you believe, uh, how are you doing, how do you check in, how are you feeling. Uh, and because we already had that piece started, we've been able to really leverage that to our advantage during this particular season that we are in. So someone just let us know the chat was off, but it's now on. So folks can now put questions yeah. in there. Sorry about that. <laughs> so tell us how you've been making this shift um, to this new time that we're in. Uh, you know, like I said, our folks have been pretty flexible, but it also has taken a large amount of intentionality on our part. Uh, and I think what a number of colleagues that I've talked to have encountered now is that we've hit a moment where we thought we were toward the end of it and we realized we were actually only in the middle. Uh, and so there's sort of this recalibration that we're experiencing across the board, trying to reorient and see, figure out what is sustainable uh, and what is going to help us not just make it through the next three months, but transition more easily back into whatever is coming next, uh, back or into, uh, depending upon how you look at it. Um, because we had that existing online community, we were able to transition that pretty well, although it's not been without its hitches. Um, as we all have experienced, worshiping without a congregation present is a weird feeling. Uh, it's very strange to preach to an empty room or to a camera. Um, singing without others singing with you doesn't quite carry the same joy that it carries otherwise. Um, and figuring out how to worship the most fully we can. That means including sacraments, uh, communion and baptism, um, and having new members join and welcome, welcoming them into the community. The biggest challenge that we've had so far is actually a financial one, and I'd be curious to hear how some of you are doing with this. Uh, we are a church that has grown pretty quickly over the last seven years and pretty substantially. Uh, our budget at this point is about 150% higher than what it was when I first came. Uh, but that's because we fundraise over $75,000 a year. Uh, and we're anticipating this year because of the pandemic and the shutdown, um, losing about $45,000 of that potential fundraised income. And so we are entirely shifting how we are fundraising and trying to build connections so that we can keep our entire staff employed and we can keep the ministry of the church going. Uh, and largely, we've been able to utilize Facebook fundraising to that end, and I'm glad to talk some more about that. Yeah, I, you know, I think the other thing that we did in the early days of this whole transition is um, we allowed ourselves to pair back to basically a zero base. We didn't try to say we have 50 different things that are happening and how do we keep them all going. We said, all right, what are the, what are the five things that we have to do week one that we really cannot do without and how do we make those work? And then as each week has progressed, other things have started to layer on um, in, in terms of what we've done um, to, to make that happen. And I actually want to grab, Ann Westerman put a, a, a question in the chat I want to grab right away because she asked how long have you had staff for technology? The answer is we don't. Um, so uh, we are admittedly blessed that, that John has a very strong comfort level with a number of different technologies, has done a tremendous amount, particularly in the social media area and in the, the video audio production area um, leading up to this. So we had that available. Uh, and then, um, you know, I'm, I'm a part-timer uh, that had a, a completely different uh, mission going into 2020 than it's kind of evolved into this year. Um, but realistically, I'm, I'm kind of, I've kind of been a Sunday's only guy up till now, and that's, that's uh, exploded into any number of, of days. So um, 
I think it's not about staffing up or trying to find money to ramp, ramp up a staff to do this. It's about finding the people that can do the pieces of the puzzle that you need. Um, it may need to be split apart. You may need three or four different people to do different aspects of what you're doing, but find those people because they're in your community. You have people in your community that have that knowledge uh, and that capability. Um, it may even be relying on uh, your, your local public school system to help you with some of the high school students that have experience in audiovisual technology, uh, in streaming technology, can you can they connect you and, and maybe do a little bit of help in getting you going things like that so are you saying you don't think that churches need to shift their staff at this point to deal with technology do you think of volunteers is is enough um, loaded question, Tiffany, <laughs> uh, because I, I admittedly put in way more time than, uh, than what my compensation would, would uh, cover. But, you know, when we're in this field, we, we do it for reasons beyond compensation, not admittedly. Um, I, I think that we have to work within the realistic resources that we have. John already alluded to the fact that from a revenue generation standpoint, um, we're all uh, quite hindered in our abilities and what we're able to do. And so you have to try to figure out what you can do within the means that you have. Um, you know, I'm not sure that adding a tremendous volume of staff right now to focus on technology issues that you're battling now uh, is the right answer because quite honestly, in six months, this could look completely differently in terms of what the needs of the church are and what we're trying to accomplish. You want to jump in, Jonathan? Or um, yeah, I would say that uh, the best staffing plan now and always is to fill the gaps that you have. So if you have people who are interested and have a skill set, let them do that, and then find the people who fill in the pieces you don't have already. Um, I will say that there's no going back, and so I don't know that every church needs to have an ongoing live stream experience. Um, there's a piece of me that actually hopes that this forces some closures, which I know makes me sound like a jerk, but I think that the number of churches we have doesn't serve the need of the church in the same way, the big C church. Uh, but I do think that, um, you know, how we engage people, how we in interact with people uh, is shifting and our staffing will have to reflect that. I also think this is a generational thing. Uh, and so I, I think that, you know, a, a lot of my younger clergy colleagues I uh, would not say that they are particularly gifted in technology. They would just, it's what they grew up with. And so there's a, a sort of inherent generational piece to being able to pull some stuff together. What I would advise against is deciding that, oh, we just need a young person to come do this um, because nobody likes being pigeonholed. And I think that uh, we don't want to reduce anybody to simply what they can offer us. There was another question in the chat about reaching those who were challenged technology with, with their technology. Are you... Are you finding ways to reach out to folks who can't watch? So, them? Yeah, we um, working on it. <laughs> um, this is really, I'll be honest, this has really forced a lot of people's hands when it comes to, um, to needing to update their technology. So we've had a number of people in our church. My husband is a pastor at Enfield Congregational Church, and they've experienced something similar. Folks who said, oh, I'll never get on Facebook. And what they realize is if they want to be part of the community, they're going to have to. Uh, and so that has turned the tide for us, which has been great. Uh, like I said, we've already established largely that we are an internet-based communication church. So we send emails. We don't really send letters. Even your giving statements come by email. Uh, we'll send it to you by mail if you request it, but our default is not, not that anymore. Um, we have what we have, we have a program called Call to Care, Call to Care, which divides our congregation up uh, alphabetically into groups of eight or nine, and then individuals reach out to them weekly, either by phone, text, email, or note. So that's one way, if there's individuals I know are having a hard time, I'll often um, text somebody and say, hey, would you mind giving so-and-so a call uh, to check in with them? Uh, and our weekly worship is uh, simultane simulcast on Facebook, YouTube, our website, and via a Zoom conference call. So uh, as long as you got a phone, you can still participate, uh, at least a phone. Uh, and that's turned out pretty well. Right now we have one or two a week who'll call in. One of them is our former pastor, Emer well, our current pastor emeritus, former pastor of Westfield, who lives at a uh, um, assisted living facility. And he gets a kick out of being able to call in and talk. And uh, what I don't think he realizes is that, you know, one of us has an earbud in and we're talking basically directly to him alone. Um, but it does let us say that we're making that out. What I appreciate about like a COVID silver lining here 
is that it has forced some people to, to get over themselves. I'm not talking about people who don't have access to the internet. I'm talking about the stodgy folks who think they're too good for it or it's not worth their time. Um, and when they complain or object, we turn that back on them. Uh, not in a mean way uh, or hateful way, but just in a, you know, this is at the, at the core of what we've got right now. Uh, and replicating the same work six ways to Sunday just to try to include every single person is simply not doable. And it's not an effective use of the limited resources our churches do have. Yeah, I, I think it's important to acknowledge that um, in terms of technology challenges, uh, this is not just a generational thing. There are uh, people far older than me that have that could uh, run circles around my technological abilities. There are people half my age that struggle with it. Um, so it's not a it's not necessarily an age or generation thing, so much as it is you know, individual personalities. To John's point, I think the biggest thing we can do is be as diverse as possible in our communication styles. So as as he alluded to, we're simulcasting across four different platforms for worship, giving people plenty of latitude to use whatever is easiest for them. And for some of our folks, the reason YouTube is important is because they can stream it on their television and I can just point to it and watch there. For some people, they like the interact uh, interactivity of Facebook and its social aspect of being able to comment and say hi to folks in the morning when they jump on. For some folks, it's all I can use is a phone and I just want to dial in and Zoom works for them. So we're trying to be uh, as, uh, as diverse as we can there uh, from that perspective. The other thing that I would touch on from a technology perspective is we, um, there are still limitations that we struggle with. Uh, example, closed captioning. So people who have uh, hearing disabilities and are hearing challenged. Um, now, one of the benefits of a platform like YouTube, for example, is they do automatically uh, do some closed captioning work. I think as we've all felt, it's not necessarily as accurate as we would like it to be, um, but it's at least a step in the right direction. Uh, that's one of the areas where we just don't have the resources to, to have somebody dedicated to capturing in writing an entire liturgy uh, and then getting it inserted in the right places in a video feed for folks. So uh, there are some te still some technological barriers that, that we struggle with. I see um, Jeffrey Birch asks, while we're talking about streaming to multiple platforms, what technology? I'll let Kevin go into the specifics, but I'll tell you that we use uh, open source software called OBS uh, to sort of do the stream itself. And we're able to, if you go look at our, any of our, on facebook.com slash Westfield UCC, you can go see any of our live worships and see sort of like the slick slides at the beginning. And then when somebody stands up to talk, don't, not this Sunday, because we had a huge tech issue this Sunday. Go to Sunday before that though. Uh, and you can see it. <laughs> um, and, you know, like a slide will come up with a scripture or a slide will come up with giving information. Or uh, if we've changed, sometimes I'll on a whim change a song and we'll put lyrics up that way. So you can see sort of what that looks like. Um, and then we have an account with mystreamspot.com, which is the actual cloud-based platform that shoots it out to all the different places we want it to shoot out to. And Kevin is actually the one who signed us up for it. And he'll, he can tell you some of why we chose that particular company over others. Sure. So as John alluded to, um, you, you sort of have uh, two or three things to consider. Uh, utilize, utilization of uh, open broadcaster software, OBS, that open platform, is how you are getting your video and audio all in one place electronically and being able to send it. When we first started, uh, our video was through an iPhone. And our audio was through a uh, USB mic you could purchase on Amazon for less than ninety dollars, uh, plugged into the laptop, and that was it. And so it was, it was pretty good. Yeah, the like quality was, on the USB was mic was pretty good. good. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, the quality on the mic was good. Uh, I will say that too. Um, when you're looking at this, if your audio is pristine and your video is junky and dropping out and coming in, people will stick around. If your video is 4K spot on precise, but your audio keeps coming in and out or it's staticky, people will drop. The audio is way more important than the video. So if you're gonna invest in anything bare minimum, get a good microphone uh, to, to start with uh, and then build from there. The um, streamspot.com uh, uh, resource that we use for the streaming platform uh, that John alluded to is a couple of reasons. One is there are any number of them that do what StreamSpot does, which is they take the feed from what we're sending from OBS and they dispatch it to different places. So they take that one feed and they send it to uh, a web viewer that they've given us the ability to embed within our website, as well as Facebook and YouTube. Um, so they handle that, you know, going to multiple platforms. Um, 
the big reason why I had recommended we go with StreamSpot out of the gate is StreamSpot can be subscribed for $80 a month uh, for what most people will find is well with, uh, within the, the needs that they'll have for the platform. And you can subscribe at that rate month to month. So when we first started and we went into this, we didn't know this was going to be a permanent thing. And most other services, you had to do an annual contract. So not having to lock in up front and being able to basically test this and see how long it goes at a really reasonable price kind of gave us the, the reason for doing it this way. Yep. What he said. <laughs> <laughs> so there's been a couple of questions about fundraising and John, you touched on it a couple of times, but there were specific questions about, is there a way to have like links in your Zoom that people can actually click on to give money and then also, how do you do Facebook fundraising? What do you suggest? What's work? So if you do, um, so first I would say you should have a giving page on your website. So one of my side gigs is making websites for people and for churches. Um, and when you put your giving portal on your website or embedded in your website, you add legitimacy to it and to your church. So that's number one. And then if you're using Zoom like this, you should just pin the comment, the link at the top. Welcome to worship. Here's the giving link and pin it as a comment to the top of your chat. Uh, we don't use Zoom that way. We use Zoom solely with, for basically the conference call feature. So there's no visual connection for us on Sunday morning. So that's not something we use. Uh, during our offertory on Sunday morning, using OBS, uh, the open broadcast software, is that what? Yep. Um, there is a slide that comes up uh, that you will see if you go like skim through any of those services, uh, except for the Sunday. And during the slide, you'll see uh, it says four ways, four easy ways to give right now. Uh, and what it includes is uh, you can go to westfielducc.org slash giving, which lets you give through our secure online portal, which is through the church management software Breeze, which is cloud-based. Uh, text to give, which is through Breeze as well. Oh, there we go. Uh, text go, to John. give, which is number two. <laughs> number three, uh, you can use our paypal.me account, which if you go to paypal.me slash whatever, you go directly to a page on your mobile device where you punch in a number you want to give and it goes through, right? Uh, and then using your PayPal mobile app, you can basically take a QR, screen grab the QR code here, capture, and go to PayPal to do that too. So we accept payments and donations through both uh, PayPal and Breeze. Um, that's because, you know, PayPal has a market share and people are familiar with it. And most people have PayPal accounts. Um, and basically, any way for you to give us money is a good way. So that's Sunday morning. What we've now our typical fundraising pattern and plan uh, involves a number of church suppers. They're called third Saturday suppers, and they are exactly what they sound like a supper every third Saturday of the month for the first six months of the year. It includes three giant events a golf tournament, the Woodstock Fair, uh, and our bazaar. The golf tournament has already had its date moved, and we hope it won't be canceled. The Woodstock Fair has already canceled for this year. That's like a $17,000 weekend for us. Um, so, this is like we're talking like big bucks we've got to figure out. Uh, so the little ones and the big fundraisers are getting shot. And so we had to really come up with a new way. And what we found is Facebook fundraising works really well for us, but it works well for us within particular parameters. The first is we never just post on behalf of the church and say, hey, give us money. It's always got a shtick. So example, uh, if it's a church, if like Westfield Church organizes a fundraiser, and you can go see these on facebook.com slash fundraiser slash Westfield UCC or the other way around, um, you'll see that the ones that the church itself has organized always have a gimmick. Um, the first one, we usually have a pie tent where we sell actual pies for $14 a pie at local festivals. Those festivals got canceled. So this year we sold virtual pies, $14, uh, and each pie you bought I uh, got you an entry into a raffle for a key lime pie that I'm known for making in our church. Uh, and that ended up being like almost a $3,000 fundraiser for us. Our goal was to make $1,200. Um, so that was great. Uh, we, we made a joke out of it, you know, like all the joy, none of the calories and just let people go for it that way. Next, uh, one we're wrapping up right now is uh, our Light in Our Hearts campaign, which started as a Light in Their Hearts campaign, which was for essential workers. Uh, a month ago, one of our members, we had a big meeting online and said, you know, well, we got to come up with 45,000. How are we going to do it? And one of our members said, you know, let's put red hearts in our windows. People are doing that. And uh, I said, yes, and let's make them cellophane and let's light them up from the inside. Uh, and it's become a thing. In fact, we're going to release today uh, pretty soon after I get off this call, a promo video for it. 
stop by and see it. It's beautiful. One of the things our churches have, many of them are beautiful old buildings that look good when they're lit well. And uh, part of fundraising is using what you've already got and uh, using it to your advantage. And that's what we found here. So we uh, sold basically hearts, small ones for $12, big ones for 18, I wanna say. Maybe it was 10 and 12, I forget. You can look in the fundraiser and see. Uh, but between online donations and mailed in donations on that front, uh, we're nearly at $4,000 for that fundraiser. Um, so those are two church-based ones that are examples. We've got some others in the works. Yep, here you go. You can see some of the pictures there, what it looks like. Um, then we're cultivating individual members who know how to use uh, Facebook fundraisers to do it for their birthdays. Uh, the thing that we're very specific about in asking people to do birthday fundraisers is, and this is true across the board for Facebook fundraisers, hear me when I say it, you must meet your goal. So the way you meet your goal is you do not overshoot. You do not say I need $6,000, you undershoot and you can move up a little bit. I think a good rule of thumb is you can up it twice, but you don't need to keep, like if you keep getting money, you don't keep jabbing up your goal. Uh, you start with $500, if you hit 600, you're like, let's see if we can go for eight. You don't go from 600 to 1500, right? Uh, because people like an underdog story, but they like being part of a successful story more. And so if, if they realize that you're 20 bucks or $100 away from making your goal, they're gonna be like, oh, I can help them get there. If they realize you're $800 away, ah, eh, no shot in hell, right? So that's an important thing. Only go up it one or two times. Don't overestimate, uh, which is hard when you ask people, like it becomes trendy. Oh, I'm gonna do a birthday fundraiser and then people do it and, and then they overestimate and then they do those things and it looks bad. Uh, so we intentionally are working on going and asking people who have uh, in the Venn diagram of connections, connections outside of the church that we've already crossed over. Um, and when they do it, we want them to make a compelling case for it. Um, I did one for my 35th birthday and asked people to give $35. Uh, and that became like another, that became ultimately between mail-in donations and online donations, like a $6,000 fundraiser for us unexpectedly, which thank goodness, because that was right, that was March 21st. So that was right when we stopped worshiping in person. So those are all ways that we've worked on Facebook fundraising. We also have some in the works that will actually come through our website so people can give online. Of course, we always make sure to let people know where they can mail a check and what to put in the memo line. Uh, my daddy says, if someone hands you money, take it. And so we are all about giving people the most ways uh, to hand us money. And a final word about that, people can smell bullshit. So you need to be as authentic uh, and genuine in your ask and what you're going for as you can be. Uh, and that's one reason we don't keep upping it. If you keep upping it, you look greedy. Uh, if you up at one or two, you look optimistic and hopeful, and that's a different read than it might otherwise be. Yeah, I mean, the more real you make the need, the better, right? So as people understand, if I'm giving, kind of what's the outcome of all this? Um, so I had also done uh, a birthday fundraiser on Facebook, and I connected mine to uh, the, the added cost of live streaming, right? That, that here's something that we never had as an expense line for, but that people are indicating an appreciation for, for, uh, for and said, look, our streaming service is not free, it costs us money. And if we could reach a certain plateau, you will have helped us to uh, cover the cost of that live streaming service for the balance of 2020. Uh, and we were able to get there um, because people had sort of that tangible understanding of this is what this is going to generate as a result. Um, and I think the, the, uh, the only other thing that you have to be careful of, um, you know, it's, it's, and John alluded to it before too, it's that overlapping of, of just too much hitting people up, right? So you've got to make sure your cadence of your fundraising is at a pace that people can absorb. Um, and so, you know, we deliberately uh, have not done some other huge creative new fundraising activity uh, prior to doing uh, our, our Light in Their Hearts campaign because we can't double up and, uh, and just have people kind of whittle down the amounts they're giving for a particular cause. To that end, um, you should not double up your church's fundraisers. Birthday fundraisers are sort of separate. It won't help, but it's, right. not, but it's like people's own impetus to do that. Um, also, what I would say is I was worried about stacking stuff up a whole lot to or doing too many oversaturating fundraisers. Uh, and one of our members who's actually on this call said to me, uh, I don't know, people either give or they won't. And um, that, that is true. But what they won't do is give without the opportunity uh, or rarely. And so uh, giving, offering people the opportunity to participate has been key on our front. 
The main mistake I see my colleagues doing for their churches though for Facebook fundraising is they're asking for too much money and it seems insurmountable and so they don't reach it. It's much better to have your success story and then do it again in a couple weeks than it is to not reach that goal. So John, the, the Lighten Your Hearts campaign, your church has done stuff with hearts again and again. That's part of your identity. Do, do you want to talk about how you've kind of establish that identity in the community and and sure yeah important to be authentic like what does yeah. this relate to your church's why and how is that all tied together uh real quick before that andy just said with all this internal fundraising are you worried it will affect pledges but here's the beauty <laughs> of facebook we're not targeting our internal people our internal people will give because they care about the church and they'll give additionally so that's not impacted our pledge income uh, our pledge income has stayed relatively stable uh it's our loose plate offering that's taken the hit because there is no loose plate to put offering in. Uh, and what it's actually done is it's broadened our community appeal because people feel like they can support us, which is brilliant because when we're back together, they're still gonna feel like we're theirs or they're part of us. Um, so it's really a win-win on our front. So uh, community building uh, beyond us, yes. Um, listen, you gotta have a gimmick. And I've said that before here and I'm gonna say it again. And ours is an authentic one, which is the heart of killing Lee. We are geographically in the center of Killingly. Uh, we have been the spiritual heart of Killingly for more than 300 years. And we considered our mission, our vision statement, we don't have a formal one, but the sort of litmus test for everything we do, uh, the lens we view everything through is, is it helping us to care for the heart of Killingly? Uh, and that is it. We're a community church. Every church has an identity. There's churches that are really social justice oriented. There's ones who are committed to global mission work, local mission work. Um, for us, it's about taking care of our community. And so you're gonna see that. The, the donations we're gonna give to are the ones that impact locally. The drives we're gonna participate are the local drives. Um, and the ministries and efforts we make are going to be the local ones. And that's different for everybody. But once we found stumbled upon this statement, uh, the heart of Killingly, it then became a mantra for us. Um, and the heart has become a, a symbol for us. So you'll see a lot of our graphics and I do a whole at Super Saturday uh, a whole like whole day workshop on marketing and telling your church's story. Um, but part of the narrative we've curated and cultivated and curated is this caring for the heart of Killingly. And the beauty behind it is we change the phrase caring to anything we want. Praying for the heart of Killingly, celebrating the heart of Killingly, feeding the heart of Killingly, loving the heart of Killingly, you name it. Uh, we just pop it in there and it gives us a whole amount of flexibility. And what it does is it uh, immediately connects us beyond religious belief. Um, and that's what allows us to be uh, really a community beacon beyond a, just a faith-based one. People see us as caring for them, whether or not they're ours, whether or not they're religious, whether or not they're people of faith. Um, and that's actually pretty beautiful in, in my eyes. So if you go through on our Facebook page and you see any of the videos that are for like promotional videos, one of the things you'll notice is a lot of heart imagery. Um, and we, in fact, um, painted a giant heart on our front doors <laughs> uh, maybe a month and a half ago, uh, which has had a tremendous response from the community and part of which led to these hearts in the windows uh, and in our steeple. Um, and, you know, taking, having the boldness to take something that people perceive as uh, stodgy history, which is basically all of our churches, um, and making it relevant in the moment, being willing to paint a heart on the door, not put up a wreath, not put up a paper one, but like get out there with paint that you're going to have to take down later and make a statement that has really communicated beautifully to our church. And what we find to our community, I mean, and what we find is that when people are in times of crisis uh, or transition, that we're a place they reach out to. They come to us, whether or not we've been their church home before. And that's really beautiful to me. That's ministry. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. <laughs> did, you tell, did you tell me that you've added new members even since pandemic? Yeah, so um, one of the things we've been working on uh, is having a full worship experience. So uh, that means sacraments need to be practiced, uh, baptism and communion, and we needed to figure out how to have new members join uh, because we've been uh, through this whole distance uh, experience. Uh, our circle has grown much wider. Uh, we've already had a lot of people say, oh, there's a Westfield around me, I'd go there. Um, 
and now they're able, able to. And so we've extended membership to distant members, distance members, uh, which basically means uh, when people join, we ask them to give their time, talent, and treasure. Uh, like many of us, give, give your time, show up, uh, your talent, help out, give what you can financially, right? Uh, so what we say is if you're a distance member, we want you to show up online in the ways you can, uh, give what you can to Westfield, and the help out is help out locally in the name of Westfield. So if there's a backpack drive we're doing at Westfield, find a local backpack drive and give them your bags and tell us what you did. Uh, and I think that's beautiful because I think the, the church is universal uh, and it's beyond us. And if that's a way that we can build community, particularly now that it's clear, that online ministry is going is here for the long haul, and that this is not a temporary stopgap. Um, that's really become beautiful. So yeah, we've had uh, in May we had eight new members join, uh, which was pretty cool. Uh, and what we did is I interviewed them on Zoom one on one and just asked them the questions. We have two sets of questions at Westfield: the Jesusy ones, that's actually what we call them, which are uh, like, will you be faithful to the church? Do you uh, is Jesus your savior? Do you love him? Blah blah blah. Reject evil work for good in the world. And then we have the essential questions, which are, uh, will you fight with us? Will you forgive us? And will you bring us casseroles when we're sick? And we ask the congregation that too. And what we're really asking is, uh, are you in it with us? Are you here or not? Um, and so I ask each member that one-on-one uh, -on -one in Zoom, and then I instruct them to use their own cell phone and record themselves answering those questions. I do, I will with the help of God. Um, I promise with the help of God, I think are the three I need. Uh, and then we just spliced together a simple video on iMovie of me asking the questions and then um, one person replying to the first question, the second person replying to the second question, the third person, the third, and so on. Uh, and we splice that right into worship. So worship for us is a live experience. I'm actually pretty adamant that it should be a live experience. That's my preference. Um, I understand the reasons to pre-record and I don't judge people for doing it. Uh, but I think the... the um, the communal generative moment is really important. The fact that we are in the moment doing this together uh, is something that holds us together. That said, I think hybrid worship's great and being able to put this little video in, we sing a song all the time when people join. So we sing the song beforehand and people join in the middle and then we come back out and keep singing and it just becomes sort of this seamless little, little piece. Um, and folks are then included in our Facebook group and we reach out to them and we've actually had some people join who I've not met in person. Uh, so that's what's super cool is it's not like people, not all of them have just been waiting on the benches and finally decided to pull the trigger. Although we do have people who have been those and it's been this experience that has said to them, this is where I want to be. Uh, and so that's been really powerful too. So, so what do you see going forward then? You know, you've got folks joining online who haven't been to the church. You're doing online worship. At some point, you'll probably be doing in-person worship again. How are you yep. going to do all of those things together? <laughs> or yeah, are so um, believe it or not, we have a plan for that. Um, <laughs> you that. Uh, That's we actually good. <laughs> just released our um, reopening plan yesterday, which is like a Dickensian novel of explaining why we are doing what we're doing and what the plan is. Uh, and if any of you are interested in seeing that, just send me an email, john, J-O-N, at westfielducc.org, and I'm glad to send you what we sent out. Um, or friend me on Facebook, and I'll message it to you. But uh, starting in September, so we're live streaming through Labor Day. Then starting in September, we'll move to two services a Sunday, 9 and 11 o'clock. And one of those two, likely the 11, but maybe the 9, will be live streamed as well. With our entire congregation split alphabetically, group one and group two. Uh, every month through December, they will switch uh, back and forth. So uh, you're never always at the same time based on the month. Um, and because we're going to continue live streaming on that capacity, our distance members, people who have uh, sort of become gotten in the habit of being part of our circle of care remotely will continue to be able to do so. Um, how we continue to build them, I will tell you, our, our, and this is where, you know, we really have an advantage, like that Facebook group, uh, is one of the first things I established when I came here. So it's, you know, six or seven years old now. Um, and has a real culture of caring for each other and people put their concerns without being prompted and they reach out to each other without being prompted. And uh, it's really empowered our congregants to take care of each other, which is a really beautiful thing. Uh, so once people are in that group, uh, you know, they, they feel like they're part of it, whether or not they're there in person. 
Yeah, and you know, John had talked about the uh, the, the planning, right? So uh, we we made the conscious choice a few weeks into this that we knew that, for example, live streaming worship was going to be something we were going to have to continue. So we started to set a, a roadmap and. Uh, what we didn't do was we didn't build the roadmap to say, here's what the Taj Mahal of live streaming looks like. And that's what we want to go out and purchase. So we need to raise $20,000 and go out and buy all this equipment. We, uh, we deliberately built it so it could be layered. So we could say, if we're going to move to live stream with people uh, present, there are a couple of things that will have to change, but not everything from where we are. And we could gradually build on that. Um, you know, there are certain things that I think all of our churches face that are the bigger uh, challenges for us. One of the biggest is just an infrastructure thing, and that's the broadband service coming into the building. So your internet, we, we deliberately made the choice to do what we do. Uh, and not to just use an iPad or a phone using uh, Facebook by itself, for example, um, because internet service can be so spotty. Um, and so uh, we deliberately had a, uh, an ethernet cable run from our office. Right now, it runs through a stairwell and up and over, you know, a, a bunch of barriers and, and boundaries and across the floor to get to where it is. We will have to change that you know, before September, before we get back in, in person. So uh, we know that's one of the things that we have to adjust or, or change. Um, you know, do we have to switch up uh, the audio setup? Not necessarily. The audio is working really well right now. So we want to stick with what we've got. Yeah, a, a lot of churches with their online worship have been doing, you know, close-ups of the pastor, like where you're sitting right now. And, and how is that going to translate when you're in person and live streaming? Are you going to kind of have up front and people have so yeah so Kevin has done this brilliant thing and he made me a, a spreadsheet of you know the gold standard like if we were to do this like Joel Osteen style what would we need like as much as a UCC Joel Osteen thing would happen um, and to be honest that's like a twelve thousand dollar plan um, we were able there's like a really great mid level and that's about eight thousand and there's a very doable uh, level that's like a three thousand level uh, which is our first one we're going for. <laughs> um, the beauty of this plan is that it's expandable. And so you can, you start with sort of the smaller case and you go beyond, but the answer is we're buying a, a better camera uh, that will be installed along our balcony rail and we'll be able to do shoots while I'm up in the pulpit um, or doing whatever on the floor uh, here or there. It will require a little more training for volunteers. It's also not what we've hired Kevin to do. And so we'll need to find some people uh, to to sort of take on the day-to-day -day operations of it. Um, but it's there's a plan in place to be able to maintain not just um, an experience, but a good one. And I think that's what's really key is if you can't do it well, I'm not saying that like you have to do it A plus every week, um, but God deserves our best. Uh, and it's okay for us to have expectations of what it is we're putting out and to strive for those expectations and to name when things aren't good enough or don't meet those expectations. Um, and so, you know, I think it's easy, particularly when we're getting tired and really stressed and irritated with the fact that this just keeps going on uh, to throw up our hands and be like, well, that's good enough. In some weeks, that's what we got. But when we're talking about this long-term stuff, um, we need to, to upgrade what we're expecting. Uh, at our church, we call that Westfield Well. We do things Westfield Well. Uh, and so we're, we don't deal in half-assery, and, um, and that's not just, that's for me, that's for my staff, that's for our congregation. Uh, we hold each other to those standards, and that's not just because we want to be successful, but that's because we believe God deserves our best, and so we strive for that, and that's why you hear things like Kevin saying, you know, like, I work a lot more than I'm paid for. Well, he shouldn't have to do that. Ditto, but it's what God, what we realize is that we want to offer that to God, and so there's a piece of um, you know, of self-offering in that. Yeah, and, and technically, uh, you know, I think the, the biggest challenge is the one you hit on, which is the video aspect, right? Audio, uh, microphones, a decent soundboard and an adapter to run it through USB and you can get really good quality audio and you have plenty of cable distance that you can run. Um, I mentioned the ethernet piece and getting the, the internet service. The second piece is, is what John just alluded to and that's the camera. So right now we're actually, we've been doing our worship where John is down on the floor as opposed to up at a pulpit um, and very close to our piano. 
Um, so we're, uh, we're appropriately socially distanced, but we're close enough that with a, a regular camera zoom, we're able to do it. The next step up camera, there are uh, cameras that are referred to as PTZ, pan tilt zoom cameras. They give you two advantages. One is they can give you a really good distance of zoom. Now, don't think you can mount one centrally in the back of your uh, sanctuary and you're going to be able to zoom in and see the freckle on the face of the, of the pastor. That's not going to happen. Uh, it will get more and more grainy as you, as you go more on zoom. But um, we've got a couple of positions that we think we can mount the camera uh, to get close enough so that we can get a, a reasonable shot. Um, visually. And, uh, you know, and again, to, to John's point, we're going to start with, you know, you start with a single camera, you're going to get one angle, but that will be enough because we'll cover the main place we need to go. As we gain funds and we're able to add a second or a third camera, now you can do camera switching and I can have a camera that's looking out at the congregation or I can have a camera that's zooming in on the choir when they're performing, or when we get there, you know, things like that. Um, so that's the building process that we have to go through. Kevin, a couple people uh, who are watching this on Facebook are asking if you could share your spreadsheet with your, your different uh, tiers of, of technology. Yep. No, I'm happy to share that information. Uh, same as John. So mine is simple as 12. It's Kevin at WestfieldUCC.org uh, or, or uh, connect with me on Facebook. Um, I'm happy to share that information. Sure. Great. To be fair, Here. just not to put more work on Kevin, that sheet's specific to Westfield. So it'll give you a glimpse of what is good, but know that like it's going to say like you need two spools of 500 feet of whatever wire. Well, that's because we have a giant balcony and right. where the office is and all those specifics. So um, just know, like take that with a grain of salt. Right. Yep. There's another question in the in the chat here on Zoom about you know what if you do what do you do if the worship leader is not a singer? <laughs> uh, yeah, find one who is. <laughs> I'm not kidding. He's he's not kidding. Doing, if you're doing online distance worshiping, um, I'm, I hear all the joyful noise stuff, and I'm here to tell you that like uh, what Kevin said earlier about the audio signal being the key uh, is also true on the quality of what you're putting out. So not, you don't need to be a Broadway star, you don't need to be at the Met, but you need to, if there's somebody who is skilled at singing that can come in and stand 10 feet away from you with a microphone and lead that particular song, that is something we should do. Uh, also, what I would tell you about when we're back in person worship, uh, it is okay to record it live and then premiere it later, which to me is in a different category than pre-recorded worship that's been cultivated throughout the week or created throughout a previous week and then released. Um, if you find that having a bare recording then putting it in and making it shinier uh, and posting it within a couple hours is better for your church and puts a better foot forward based on your resources, that's cool. We do all of our video editing uh, in iMovie on a Mac. So there's no fan, like the video we're about to release in an hour or two is seriously iMovie. So uh, there's a lot at our fingertips. But yeah, you should find somebody who can sing. Yeah, you know, and I, I've seen a couple of different approaches. So to John's point, if you've got somebody that can be your worship leader socially distanced with a microphone in their hand, that's fine. Uh, I have seen uh, churches that have had their uh, their music pieces recorded. So you're still doing a live worship, but as John told you before, you can intersperse recorded content. So if you have a performance uh, from worship uh, musicians that you play from video in those segments, you can drop those in. And so you can have that mix between live speaking and recorded uh music, that's fine too. It's, it's whatever your resources are going to allow you to do in your place. So we're at, we haven't quite hit an hour yet, but we're getting close. Um, and I think we've hit all the questions that I've seen posted. What else, what else do you want to tell people, you want people to know? Um, I would say that if you are not leveraging your online financial opportunities for fundraising now, you're missing a golden opportunity. This has forced many of our congregants hands to become uh, technologically adapted. And you have a really um, pertinent story to give them about signing up for recurring online giving, uh, for PayPal, whatever. Uh, and you need to um, really leverage that the best you can. Now, Kevin is actually the one who set up for us the Facebook, went, jumped through all the hoops to do make us a Facebook charitable organization. Um, but if you haven't done that, there are a couple of little quirks to it based upon how we're, what our um, 501c3 status is and through and whatever. But once you get it set up, it's brilliant. Um, and right now, you know, like I know Facebook's a big, bad, evil organization. 
they're not charging fees for those donations. So when we say we raised $4,000 on Facebook, we mean they gave us a check for $4,000, um, which when you go through PayPal or Breeze uh, or any online giving portal, they're gonna charge you uh, transactions. So that is definitely something to consider if you're talking about doing this on a larger scale. Um, and the trick is once you get people on recurring giving, those gifts are recurring. And so the, the likelihood of them stopping the recurring is like subscriptions online that you pay for. Like people really don't take the time to go unsubscribe or cancel their subscription. And those companies are banking on you doing that, right? And uh, likewise, you can benefit from it too. So that'd be my advice is look into that. Yeah, and you know, I've, I've given uh, or shared this perspective in my secular career tons too. You don't have to know it all, but you have to know who knows, right? So uh, it's about building the resources that you need for those aspects uh, that you're trying to go after. So, you know, John's touched on, on fundraising. If that's the aspect of the place you need to hone in, and find those people that have some strengths in that area and develop relationships with them and, and get that information. Um, for me, from the tech side, from a live streaming perspective, I nearly immediately joined a Facebook group called called literally churches that live stream. It's that simple. Uh, it is, you know, uh, a, a non-denominational group. They're from all different sects. Um, and they are more than willing to entertain questions from the most basic to the most profound. So uh, they show the, the type of grace that I would expect a church-based group to show uh, as people come in. But they've been an incredible blessing when you say, look, I tried to do something last week and, you know, the video just went wonky and maybe here's a snippet of it in, in from my worship. Can you give me some ideas on what might have caused it? And they've all got, because they've been down this road before, some answers to help you. So find those resources uh, all over the place to help get you there. Uh, and finally, I would say, um, Reach out to either of us anytime, John, J-O-N, or Kevin at westfielducc.org. Find us on Facebook, like our Facebook page. Uh, for the clergy among us or whoever, if you would like to see what our group is like, request to be added to the Facebook group, uh, which is just facebook.com slash groups slash westfielducc. And uh, that will give us, you can, you can pop in and you can see sort of how we build community and how it works and what's going on, uh, because that's really where we have our conversation and connection throughout the week uh, in, a, in a really effective way. Uh, and finally, this is a great opportunity and time for you to brand your church. So if you're on social media and you do not have a unified username or a handle across Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, um, you need one. So work on that for us. You've noticed everything's Westfield UCC. Find yours and get to unifying them because it makes a difference as you're trying to build the momentum of getting people to show up for you wherever you are. So there you go. Easy, right? That's it. We're fine. It's going to be fine. We're all good. <laughs> well, thank you, both of you, um, for offering to do this and, and just for talking to everybody. Um, this recording will stay on the conference's Facebook page, so people can watch it there anytime and share it. Um, and just thank you. <laughs> Thanks for sharing. Thanks for having us. I appreciate Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Thank you. All right. Take care, everyone. Bye.